So before I bring up the next uh, presenter, which hopefully if you were here for, for, the, uh, for the film fest, you got to catch his project. Um, I recently had a conversation with the chief impact officer for McDonald's. Now, stick with me for a second for this story. Um, we started talking about patties for hamburgers. And I was very cynical in my approach of saying, wow, well, I guess you source that delicious pre-processed frozen beef from all over the world and, you know, boo-hoo for you. And he looked me square in the face and he said, you know, Luis, if we're sourcing from Brazil, um, it's not just about the beef patty. It starts with the land that the cow is grazing on. Is the farmer paid fairly? Um, is that field, was it clear cut from the rainforest? Was the road to that clear cut ethically put in? Or was it subsistence farming that followed an illegal road um, all the way down to politics and policy for supply chain? But it starts with the ground. And so when I introduce uh, Peter, I, I just want you all to think about the interconnectedness of this all the way down to your quarter pounder with cheese. This, this matters. The conversations that we're having matter. So Peter Bick um, and Roots So Deep, which is on Netflix, is one of the most extraordinary and powerful um, things I've seen in quite a while. He has over 25 years of experience as a director and editor, and today he's going to share with us some of his most recent work. Um, he's been leading a $10 million research project comparing regenerative grazing with conventional grazing and collaborating with 20 scientists and 10 farm families focused on soil carbon storage, biodiversity, and water cycling. It, water recycling. Um, it just it gives me great pleasure um, to bring Peter to the stage. Peter? Thanks, y'all. So this work began in 2013, and it really began before that. Um, I made a movie called Carbon Nation that came out in 2010, and that was about solutions to climate change. And in the making of that film, we were kind of confused. We were being told that soils could be a great way to draw down carbon, but we were also told that eating meat was really bad for the planet. So we had this Meatless Mondays thing and what you could do at the end of the film. Um, and that's where I was then. Um, but as I finished up the Carbon Nation tour and I got over to ASU, I um, started hearing about grazers, ranchers, that were doing something pretty substantial. And this is Neil Dennis's farm in, in Wawona, Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, he's since passed, but he, he was doing this thing, uh, he calls it mob grazing, it could be holistic plan grazing, we call it amp grazing, adaptive multi paddock grazing. And he was doing it with about 800 head there. And then we found some folks in Texas that were doing it with 5,000 head. And it was basically, and I just want to thank the panel before me, James and Gwen. And I think I saw my colleague, Melissa Nelson, in a lot of those photographs. Did I not? Right on. So Melissa has helped teach me that the bison were the best land managers the world has known. And so what these farmers are doing is they're, they're emulating their, it's bison biomimicry. They're, they're just trying to do what the bison did because the bison are gone and we now need a proxy. And so I was just blown away by how powerful the sense of, 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 of place is on these farms. You have nature, you have squishy soil, you have bugs and birds, you smell it, you feel it. And across the fence, it's not there. So something was going on. So we wanted to figure out what that was maybe not figured out on every level because that would be impossible, but enough to see if this was, if, was this a climate solution? Certainly seemed good for the farmers. So what adaptive multi paddock grazing is or any of the other names is this farm is in Woodville, Mississippi. They'll take their, their herd and they'll move it two or three times a day during the growing season. This is just a little part of their, of their farm. And what happens is most of the farm rests most of the time. That's the game. It's a heavy hit. The animals eat about half the forage, leave about half, so it's not taking it down to the nubs, letting the soil be covered, letting it be cool, let the microbes thrive, and have multi-species of plants growing. That's the game. Right across that first row of trees is their neighbor, the Fergusons, and they do it conventionally. And they'll, they'll let the, those animals in that paddock, there's got seven paddocks on their farm, they'll let them in there for two weeks, three weeks, things like that. And you can see you could not hide a golf ball on that, on that, on that paddock. Um, so we decided to do research. And we 
decided to study all these different elements, the animal well-being, the farmer well-being, the soil carbon and nitrogen, the water infiltration, the microbial life, the bugs, the forage, nutrition, the density, is it covering the soil or is the soil exposed? The birds as an as a, as a indicator species for wildlife, specifically I'll talk about the grassland birds today. And then the greenhouse gases, methane, nitrous oxide, CO2. Uh, a lot of folks are focused on carbon right now, but when you're talking about an ecological system, if you're not talking about all three greenhouse gases, I see a nod in the audience, right? And, and did I know any of this in 2007? I did not. I'm, I'm a filmmaker and a, and, a, and, a, and a curious human being, but I've been taught by really cool people. Um, so we decided to start in the southeast U.S. because we thought we would see more carbon accrual quickly. That was the idea, just to see how high we could go, how good, how fast, if indeed it could go that way. So we, long story of how we found the five AMP farmers, adaptive multi-paddock grazing farmers, and then we went across the fence, saw if the soils were the same, the same soil type across the fence, and then asked the neighbors if we could do the same science on their land. And um, we got five out of five on the neighbors too, which was, uh, I lost a lot of sleep wondering if we'd get that. And we got that and that was remarkable. And it says a lot about the neighbors, quite frankly. Um, just to give you a little sense of grazing land on earth, there's 3.5 billion hectares of grazing land on earth. And let's just throw a number out there. If we could raise the carbon level on each one of those hectares by one ton of carbon, we could basically draw down about a third of all human carbon emissions. Um, so it's, 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 it's a significant opportunity. What I just described is massive and huge and impossible and all those things, but is it? I don't know. It's profitable for the farmer, I can tell you that. Um, so in Woodville, Mississippi, so our film, Roots So Deep, you can see the devil down there. I apologize, it has not been picked up by any streaming service, so you can't see it yet, unless you want to set up a screening in your hometown. We're on a tour right now. We just showed it up in Fort Collins on Monday night, and we got to show it in Boulder last night. Um, it's, it's 10 farm families. Episode one is these farm families that I'm going to show you here. This is Cooper and Katie Hurst on the adaptive side, and this is the Ferguson family on the conventional side. And I'm going to give you some clips now. We're going to see bits and bobs of our, of our, of our, of our documentary. So this is, this is just when, when we showed up, the conventional farmers pretty much were convinced something must have been wrong for them to be studied against their neighbor. And so we had to be very careful because we didn't think that was the case. But here you go. Have you been over to Cooper's this growing season or any, any time this year? I haven't been over to Cooper's flies. But on the highway, the part that's driving that you can see, you know, his grass will be three or four feet tall. Now, in our pasture, the grass is not that tall. I, I noticed it from the highway. I know I watched him how he rotates. I know it, uh, what looks good with them. I'm always watching. You know, you can not cheat. I will see what's going on. I think that's cheating for him. I think if you'd like to find out, you would look at He does a good job. So the idea that, that he thought it was cheating, right? Just the idea that he thought it was cheating was really interesting to me. But the fact that he was looking as opposed to criticizing was a huge opportunity because I'd been told that the conventional neighbor thought the adaptive neighbor was crazy. Like I'd been told that over and over and over again for a decade. First time out of the gate, I'm meeting that man at that moment. Wallace and I met right when I'm filming that that and he says that, I thought maybe there's more to this than, than people know. Um, so I asked them to talk. As a filmmaker, why not, right? Uh, so I got them on the porch. And so this was the first time they'd ever talked about grazing in their 25 years of friendship. And, and Wallace just was really stuck on the idea of fertilizer not being applied, as opposed to fertilizer coming out of an animal. And so this, that's what's happening right now in this scene. What is it that you think? Like when you say it right there, that's not the way you work. No. It, it's, I understand. It, but the thing is, you, I'm just saying that grass is going to grow when you put fertilizer on it. Without putting fertilizer on it, you think I'm wasting my time to be playing. Everything you're destroying away with within that. You can't feed them or 
to say anything that we have to say. Oh, we can that. It's just hard to think of how you can do this without putting it up. I'm not being up. Yeah, I'll give him right now. You know my dad. He, he's a good as gold. If you tell him you want to speak, he loves that. Yeah. But I'm telling you, dad, he loves the land, he loves the farm, he loves his cattle. But you know, if you're not spending money wastefully, and that's where we are. We are not in the waste of money. As that's much I absolutely know. The more pastures you have, and the more you move the cattle, the more grass you will grow. That is undeniable and indisputable, and that's a fact. So we we'll start when we dare to have it, cut it in half, but this allows for splitting pasture for the top of the ground. So we, I told you that we studied birds, but what we were amazed by was how powerful the birds were for the farmers. Um, especially quail. So I'm doing a little sidestep here. We're going to do a little quail talk, and you're going to get to meet uh, going to get to meet Mike McGraw, our, our our bird scientist. Yes. From the 90s to 2014, the Bobway average is approximately 5% increase in overall population. So there's been over 85% population decrease up to 2014. I do know this, Peter, when I was young, they had quail everywhere. They're not there anymore. So you heard the Bobway since we've been here? Yeah, I have. That will be the eye part we can't afford to hurt that. I can't also like mess with it. <laughs> <laughs> but I have had one or two ten years ago. This year we're hearing quail from daylight to dark, from front to back and everywhere in between. That, 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 that really makes you think. It makes you think. <laughs> So that little moment right there where, where Wallace has his mouth kind of tight, right there, <clears throat> I thought my editor had replaced that shot from some other thing. But that's in sync exactly how he was reacting to what Cooper was saying. Um, so I thought, great, we've got this. Uh, the man's concerned about money. The man's concerned about quail. Uh, he's going to change like that, no problem. Well, I went back a year later and nothing. He hadn't brought it up again, and I realized that this was a bigger deal, a harder job than, than I thought. Now, th there's probably many scientists in the room who think, wait a sec, you're trying to change people? Is that science? And it's like, well, guess what? I'm not a scientist. I'm a filmmaker who cares about people and now become a big advocate for farmers. I, I see the benefits, so why wouldn't I want to make sure folks know about it? That's where I'm coming from. I don't speak for my science team on that point. They all thought I was crazy, quite frankly that anybody would change. They thought it was nuts that anyone would change in the short period of time, that they'd even want to talk about it. So that's, that's how that was. So episodes one, two, and three of our four-part series is getting to know farmers, seeing the scientists in the field, which you haven't seen in these clips. Um, but you can see why I wanted to show you the clips. And then episode four was years later when we got to come back and bring the data to the farmers and see if it would have any impact, to see if our data would show anything. And then if it did, would it have any impact? Those are the two big questions for this project. Um, so we went back through the, through the farm communities. Now you're going to see some farmers that you haven't met yet. They're from the other episodes. So here we go. We'll start talking about soil carbon. And our soil carbon team, the, the lab work was done here at CSU uh, with Francesca Cotrufo and Samantha Mosier. So for all farm pairs, all five, average out. There's 72 and a half tons of carbon per hectare in the ant side of these farms. And there's 64 tons of carbon per hectare on the conventional side. Mm -hmm. We saw about 13% more carbon um, on average across the ant side, which is about nine tons of carbon per hectare. That's a lot of carbon. People ask how long carbon stays in the soil. It can be days moving in and out of microbes quickly, or decades getting trapped in dead roots for centuries. The dead microbes are made of carbon. It takes centuries to decompose. So then when we uh, looked at the microbes, it's 25% more numerous, diverse, and active. 
on the AMP side than the conventional side. That's a huge difference. That's a whole um, ecosystem of work. Those are the graziers, the, 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 the animals underground that are getting the job done, that are transferring carbon, that are transferring minerals and things like that. And I show this next clip. Um, James, you're from South Dakota? Yes. Yeah. So, so is this farmer. And he was having to deal with uh, July in the Southeast US, and he was not happy. So I just like showing a grumpy scientist for a second. But it's on point. It's on point. It goes to also microbes. I think the circle of life would stop. Uh, we all die. Not just us, but everything else. <laughs> and he was looking like he was about gone himself. Um, I mean, look at that. He's just look at those cheeks are so red. I was worried about him. We actually had a. We actually had a scientist that I took to the hospital. I was afraid she was getting heat stroke, and the emergency room person said she was minutes from getting heat stroke. It's hot. It's hot in the southeast, I'll tell you that. So now when we look at soil nitrogen, the real interesting thing here is our conventional farmers apply nitrogen, right? Spend a lot of money, talking tens of thousands of dollars. Doesn't necessarily going to work if it doesn't rain within a couple of days of putting it in there. And our adaptive farmers are just using the nitrogen from the plants they plant, from the urine, and from the system that they're working with, with nature. And so here's a little bit about that. Yeah, I can run a lightning check for $90,000 on this farm one year, on fertilizing, and the weather not cooperate, and literally get no growth. I mean, like, no growth. And so that was when we looked at each other and we said, don't let any of us get with me again. We never planned us, us, and we never fertilized, and it's been five years. We never fertilized again. I just wish I had the money we had spent over the years, but you know, we did what we thought we did to do. That stress is totally altered. And so just that number right there is uh, self-reported from the farmers, be, you know, uh, 2018, 2019. So that's doubled and or tripled since the Russian invasion of, of the Ukraine. And so that's a huge number. I don't have that kind of money sitting around, I'll tell you that. So uh, Teddy Gentry and his cousin Randy Owen were also one of the farm pairs uh, from the country music band Alabama. And if you don't know them, how many people here know Alabama? OK, never mind. Um, so. We were just, I'm just going to show you a clip of, of some water infiltration that we got. Um, overall, this is the difference between the AMP side and the conventional side. So there's a big difference. Um, and I also want to mention that some of the science I'm presenting to you today is published, and some of the data I'm presenting to you today is not yet published. So uh, this is published. The greenhouse gas data is not yet published. The bird data is in process. So just, just as you're taking pics and stuff like that, just to know what you're looking at. Um, so then, um, so that's two inches difference. So let's look at what two inches means. And that's every hour, by the way. And we're getting rain events that we're getting that much rain in an hour. Um, so one acre inch of, of water is 27,000 gallons, right? So that two inches is 54,000 gallons of water per acre per hour. And so if you've got a thousand acre farm, then you're talking about 54 million gallons that you're getting more in your farm than your neighbor, and your neighbor's soil's washing away while you're keeping all that water replenishing. And so this, again, it's, it's, it's from management. We worked very hard to make it as apples to apples as possible in a real world, real world setting. That We can argue that point. We could debate that point. Is it just management? Um, we did our best to isolate it so that it was. And again, fair point to argue it. So here's Teddy's response to that information. So another another thing that we studied was the insects. And um, so this what does that mean, 33% more diversity? Well, it means you have a more um, functional society of insects. Um, I was thinking when we started this project that it was about pest insects and beneficial insects. But what it is is that pest insect is a pest if you've got a monocrop and it's going haywire and nothing's there to attack it, so it's out of balance, so therefore it's a pest. But if you have that same insect on that same plant in a multi-species forage situation. It's actually part of a community. I think kinship came up earlier. And 
I looked up that word. That's a word I haven't been thinking of, James, in kinship. I think we have kinship in our insect community here um, where they're all working together. And part of that work is cycling carbon. So that was a big difference that we did not expect. Um, and then with the birds, again, this paper, uh, there's a lot of, we've, all of our papers got a lot of pushback because folks didn't, there was a lot of folks who didn't want to think of cattle as a solution, the reviewers. I think someone always said it was reviewer number three. I'm not sure about that, but, um, but um, it, it, it's taken, it takes a lot of time to get people to think about something a little bit differently. But when we look at the bird population in the U.S., the grassland bird population, it's down 51% since 1970. Uh, that was a paper out of Cornell. I think that's up to 2018, might be, might be a little bit off that year, but from that period of time. And so when looking at the grassland birds on these farms, this is the overall difference. And th this is, that graphic is, you know, it's hand-drawn, computer-generated, but we're talking across a fence. That's a huge difference. And then in our Kentucky study, the number's even more stark. It's this. And so this is the response from Mike, our bird guy, and then Marie and her husband, Billy, who were the farmers the love of it, <clears throat> on the right-hand side. So it just tells the story of a functional system and one that's broken, essentially. That's sad. That's really sad. Well, because, I mean, you know, they don't have a place to live over there. They need a place to live. Where are they? They should be there. Hmm. That's horrible. That is terrible. What do y'all think about the science that we've shared with you today? What thoughts are you having about what you've been presenting? It's still a thing that I've been doing for a long time. And I feel honored that I can respect how they be. You know, it's not about mistakes, it's just about, hey, this might work better. That's all it is. What are we supposed to do by? How do we get the carbon back? How do we do that? So when, when Prentice asked me that question, I knew we had made a huge impact to have that question asked. And his story, you know, you can't put everything in a movie, but I'll just tell you guys. His dad died when he was 10, and his mom took over the farm. And she grazed it the way his dad grazed it. And then she taught him how to graze it that way. And that's how he grazed it. And that was it. There was never any question. It was the way things were done. And that's how that tradition passed on. The Hursts, the neighbors on the other side, were first generation farmers. They didn't have that legacy of family telling them how to do it for both benefit and maybe detriment, right? It, it's, 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 it's both. So one of the things that we wanted to do was we wanted to let the data sink in. We gave all the data to all the farm families. I just gave you just a little slice just right there. Um, and we then let it sort of sink in over winter, just let it sink in. And then we came back in the spring just to check in. What data affected you more than any other data that got you thinking? Um, hearing that the land is unhealthy because it's not thought species of birds that should be here. That broke my heart. So, I want it to be healthy, you know. That's our job, is to take care of it. So we knew we were having impact. Um, so I just want to give you a little data from one specific farm pair. Our, our study was to average data over the five farm pairs, but I just want to show you one specific one. So this is in Piedmont, Alabama. I'm sure everybody knows where that is. Good. Um, northeast Alabama, not too far from Fort Payne, two hours south of Chattanooga, just in, in about two hours northwest of Atlanta. So um, when you just look at the amount of animals that the land's producing there, uh, John Lyons on the left is running 135 <clears throat> cow, <clears throat> excuse me, cows on 93 acres. Oh, did, no, thank you. I appreciate you guys. Oh, that's weird. Awesome. Um, oh, I know. Thank you. Um, so John's got 135 on the amp side, and the Garrett's that are eighth generation 
uh, farmers on the, on the other side. John Lyons is also a first generation farmer. They're doing 35 head. And when you average that out, it's three and a half times more, more animals being produced over there. And then at the same time, I showed you the carbon stocks earlier. Now we're talking about temporal carbon coming down with our uh, eddy covariance flux towers. And this is just the carbon here, and then I'm going to get to the other greenhouse gases. But he's bringing down five and a half tons of carbon, that's carbon, not CO2, per hectare per year, where his neighbor's only bringing down a ton. And so it's a huge amount of carbon coming down, and he's producing that much more food, and it's not irrigated. Both those farms are rainfall. You know, they'll, they'll run a hose out there to give the animals water. But um, as you can see with the water infiltration rates, the amp side's actually improving the water cycle greatly. So now let's talk about the greenhouse gases. So this is, again, not published data. Just want to share it with you all. So here we go. So we felt strongly that we need to look at the three main greenhouse gases on the farms, CO2, uh, methane, the CH4, and, and nitrous oxide. And, um, and so and I'm going to show you a little clip about that work. Here we go. Our greenhouse gas team was also moving in the right direction, finally getting a good handle on the years of input they collected, finding out the ban of the conventional grazing of sources, warming up the planet, or sinks, cooling it down. Our science, like all science, was evolving. Here was our most current analysis. When we added up all our data for the carbon, the methane, and the nitrous oxide, AMP was a huge greenhouse gas sink drawing down the equivalent of 3.3 tons of carbon per hectare per year. The conventional side surprised us. We thought it would be a source, but it was a sink as well, drawing down the equivalent of 0.8 tons of carbon. Even so, when thinking about climate change, the biggest bang for the buck was AMP. It was four times more powerful a sink than conventional. And if enough farmers choose to adopt it, and could be a strong solution to climate change. Farmers could help cool the earth. So I just want to look at those numbers again. So these are carbon, carbon equivalent. Most I used carbon because it was it was the same number throughout because I'm communicating to the average folk. The scientific community uses CO2. So CO2E, that's these numbers in CO2E. Um, now some folks have asked me, what about the nitrogen fertilizer coming down on the, on the conventional side? The amount of nitrogen fertilizer, it was so complicated to start that calculation that we're still in process on that. So our LCA will be the last thing we do. So that might change, but that's where we're at right now. That's why I said in the thing, our science is evolving just like all science is evolving. Um, so in the southeast U.S., there's... 15.8 million hectares of grazing land. And if we got that 12.1 tons of CO2E drawdown that we got in the five farms across the Southeast, and that's huge. I mean, that's saying, can we change all the farmers in the Southeast? Big, that's a big giant if, right? But if we could, that would be 191 million tons of CO2E each year. And a little bit over five years, we'd be at gigaton level consistently. And it would be profitable. It, it doesn't need a policy. It doesn't need a tax. Uh, it might need some ranch transition finance and some things like that, um, which is what we're going to be working on next. But it's pretty, pretty amazing what the farmers have in hand if, if they can be inspired to, to do it. So it'll only happen if the farmers want to do it. And um, one of our team members is Alan Williams. Does anybody here know who Alan Williams is? Okay. Look him up. Uh, he's, he's one of my heroes. And he helped us deeply on this project. And uh, so that's what I'm going to show you today. And we got a few more minutes to do Q&A. I want to be conscious of your all's elastic time and my tech issues. So is this accurate, the eight minutes and some change? OK, cool. So why don't we open it up for questions? And, and I'll do as much as I can. Uh, the film itself. Uh, is not open to public release yet, the documentary. Um, we're, we're looking at setting up um, what's called video on demand, so you could go to our website and buy it and own it for a, a reasonable price. We're trying to figure that one out. Um, we might even do the uh, suggested 
price and let people buy it for whatever they want. That seems to work well. Um, we had a suggested donation at a screening for $10 a ticket once, and everyone gave us 20s. I'm like, all right, all right, I like that. Um, so yeah, so if you go to rootssodeep.org, that's where all of this lives. Also, all the science lives there too. Everything that's been published is there as well. Um, you can find out where every research dollar came from on this project. Um, and uh, yeah, we don't, we, we're not hiding anything. But, but how about some questions? Yes, ma'am. I love the microphone. Here comes the mic. Um, just a small technical question. Wondering if you accounted um, for the methane from the cattle mm -hmm. in, the, in those numbers that you showed. Yeah, I didn't know how deep to go on the tech stuff. So we counted methane in three methods. Uh, the enteric emissions from the cows with a green feed, um, where you give them a snack, they have five minutes to eat, and it measures the emissions out in the field, so it's not like someplace else. Um, and, and just in that, we found that the amp side animals had 10% less methane emissions than the conventional animals. Uh, we also measured it from uh, chambers from the soil, and we also measured it from the flux towers as well. So we got methane in three methods. Um, it's a lot of numbers. I do not envy my scientists, but I am anxious to get that data published. Oh, OK. Oh, Lorenzo. Yes, you, you mentioned that there was an additional cost from the conventional to the non-conventional capital investments. Did you get that like a standard figure for all of the cases and in terms of what they have to spend in electric fans and right. water yeah. uh, provision to the animals? It's really interesting. Um, some farmers make this transition seamlessly and spend very little money. And the main thing they stop doing is bush hogging or mowing their fields. And all of a sudden they see a lot more plants growing up, attracting a lot more variety of insects. Their animals are eating a lot more of that diverse forage and their manure shows they're healthier and it's a pretty quick transition. I filmed a guy, uh, we made a bunch of short films during that 10 year period between, or the five year period of idea to getting out in the field for this work. So from 2013 to 2018. And there's a short film um, called Givers and Takers. And he was just five months in and he was seeing tremendous change. And I just saw him last week. He's now 2015. Eight, and eight years and five months in, and it's just been a beautiful tra trajectory for him. Um, but if you want to graze cattle on land that you're just growing row crops on, you're going to have to have that perimeter fence. Um, you can drag water, water around with, with just hoses on top of your soil and do it real cheap to get water to different points because you're going to have so many more paddocks than the farmers usually do. So a farm with seven paddocks, 500 acres could turn into a farm with 60 paddocks. So you have to get the water to those places. Um, and then the question is, what animals do you want to use? Um, you know, if you're going to grass finish, then there's animals that are better suited for that grass finishing. So Teddy Gentry from Alabama, he's also helped uh, breed, create a new breed of, of grazing animals called South Pole. It's red, red fur, so it's good in the heat, and it's low to the ground, very wide, and does great on grass finishing. And so those costs. I think would be the, the main costs that I've been told. And then the cost of, of knowledge gaining, right? Being taught. The teachers need to be paid, right? We need to make this a regenerative process all the way around so that that knowledge gaining needs to be um, paid for as well. Yes, sir. There's an ecosystem scientist at Yale named Oswald Schmitz. Oz Schmitz. Have you ever heard of him? I have not. I have not. So he just published a paper in Nature Communications uh, about rewilding. Okay and directionally found results like yours. That is, lands with high levels of high level trophic animals on the, on the property that are digging up the soil and doing all kinds of pooping on it and all of that. Gotta love the poop. Yeah, uh, might be two or three times as good for carbon sequestration as comparable plots without those animals. Yeah. Can I ask you to speculate about the relation of this research to rewilding? Well, I mean, if you think of birds as wild, which to me, I'm pretty sure they are, these farmers are rewilding. Like this poster is, is very accurate to what can happen. Those are the right species of birds, the right species of plants. And so it is a rewilding that these farmers are doing. I'll give you two quick stories. Um, 
John Wick, uh, when I made Carbon Nation, he started the Marin Carbon Project after I filmed him for Carbon Nation. Um, he bought a ranch with his wife in Marin County and was fully convinced to take those animals off the land. The cows are killing the world. And that was what he was told, and that's what he believed. And so the farmer who had the lease to graze that land lost the lease. And over three years, John watched his land die. That was his awakening. Like, what happened? Why did that happen? So his awakening helped be part of mine. Um, Alan Williams, the guy who I just told you about, I just got to show him because he's a good bud. Um, <clears throat> he was a tenured professor at Mississippi State fifth generation farmer from, you know, farm family, and realized he was teaching students to go out of business with everything that he was in the curriculum that he was uh, teaching. And so he quit and partnered up with a guy and got some land together. And they got it really cheap because the land had been bought by a group of investors to be a hunting land, a deer hunting concern uh, with cabins and, you know, October getting busy or November. I don't know which, where the deer hunting is in Mississippi. And there was no deer on the land, so the guys sold it to Alan and his partner really cheap. Alan started doing these methods, and within three years, there was so much uh, uh, wildlife on the land that the, the group tried to buy it back. So those are two pieces that fit that, that story. I'm going to selfishly ask a question. Oh, sure. I'm already holding the mic. I'm a storyteller and a communicator, so that's my frame. So I was hoping you could share who you made this film for mm -hmm. and the reception it's had on your show, your road show so far. Okay. And then there was a guy up here that had his hand up. Um, see, I'm on your side. I'm on your side. Um, the first film we made on this subject was called Soil Carbon Cowboys, and that was Gabe Brown, Neil Dennis, Alan Williams back in 2013. And I made that film to get McDonald's and Walmart to insist on these methods of grazing to be in their supply chain. That's why I made it. Five years later, McDonald's was coming on board as our biggest funder for this research. So I got half of it. And I still haven't gotten the Walmart side yet, but I know they're looking at this. I know Walmart has been deeply looking at different methods like this. Uh, we just haven't been able to collaborate. Um, I made this film because I wanted to record what was going to happen in the field with my science team. I had no idea I was making a four-part series. No idea. Um, and that might reflect on me not preparing enough or me just going with the flow and finding out what happens. Uh, but what I did not expect was how cool the farmers were going to be. Uh, we just got lucky. We got really lucky. And so, um, so I've made this film. Right now, our goal is to show it to every farmer on earth and let them make a decision if they want, and then make it really easy to help them make that change. And I know we got a minute, so let's. Uh, I know you have like three minutes. Um, so, since you know, the deer just collected the property, you're going to see. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, with Alan and his colleagues, Alejandro Carrillo, who works in the Chihuahuan Desert in, in northern Mexico, um, films we've made in New Mexico during a 15-year drought, films we've made in Kansas during a seriously huge drought, films we've made in Cornwall in the UK with too much water. The, there's, there's universal methods that are working everywhere um, if the people go in with both feet. I've seen people sort of halfway go in. It doesn't seem to work. Uh, our team has the same questions you do, so we're going. We're in the Dakotas right now. We're in North and South Dakota, doing the same work up there right now to see, you know, longer growing season in the South, shorter growing season in the Dakotas, cooler up there, you know, um, drier up there. So we're looking, um, but I've seen success pretty much everywhere you just described. Um, it's just there's a lot of inertia, right? There's a lot of inertia, but uh, I think. When you see the end of episode four and you see what happens in these farmers after the clips I've shown you, just learning about the soil, some of these folks are learning about it for the, all of them, conventional farmers are learning about it for the first time. We had a farmer in, Can in, in Canada, in Alberta. His dad was the first organic beef producer in Canada. And we went up there to do pre-research that led to this in film. 
And we did a soil core sample for him and put out a meter long picture of his soil, dug it and put it out there. He had never looked at his soil before. And he was at the front end of Canadian agriculture. So it's, 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 just, it's just where it's at. I know we got a, what do you want to do, Lady Jen? Should we, let's go to lunch, okay.